are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. The Blessed Woman Learning About Grace from the Women of the Bible Chapter 4 Never Turn Your Back on a Woman of God Confronting the Evil One Head On The Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. Judges 4, verse 9 At first glance, she looks like she belongs in a murder mystery rather than the pages of the Bible. Standing hammer in hand over the lifeless body of a man she just killed by driving a tent peg through his temple, announcing without remorse to those who've come looking for him, Here he is. I killed him. Most people would be quick to agree J.L. doesn't exactly fit the stereotype of grace-filled woman of God, but that just goes to show you there's more to such women than most people think. They aren't, as the old saying goes, just sugar and spice and everything nice. They can also be armed and dangerous. They can be as brave as they are beautiful and as strong as they are soft. Although they're life givers by nature, when it comes to dealing with an evil enemy, godly women can be downright deadly. That's why Satan has always been afraid of them. He found out a long time ago that just when he thinks he has a woman under control, she can turn the tables on him. She can rise up against him and become a victor instead of a victim, wreaking destruction on the destroyer. She can set entire generations free. As one of God's girls myself, I like to imagine that Satan has his own saying about us, one that has nothing to do with sugar and spice. I like to think, he says, never turn your back on a woman of God. One thinks for sure, somebody should have said it to Sisera. Of course, even if he had been given a word of warning, he probably wouldn't have listened. The Canaanite military commander of King Jabin's army, Sisera would have scoffed at the idea that a woman could cause him trouble. What woman on earth could stand up against his multitudes of soldiers and iron chariots? The entire nation of Israel had cowered under his oppression for 20 long years. He cut off their trade routes, strangled their economy, and brought the nation to its knees. Why should he be afraid of any of God's people, especially the girls? It's a good question, and it also has a good answer. As the Bible tells us in Judges 4, the rebellious children of Israel had gotten fed up with Sisera's harassment. They repented and cried out to the Lord in verse 3, and he had heard them. Sisera may not have known it, but he had a major reason to be afraid, very afraid. His army didn't stand a chance. His godless grip on Israel was destined to be shattered by a head-on collision with an unchanging spiritual fact, the turning point to every oppression comes when people cry out to God. That was true for Israel, and it's true for people today. Seeking the Lord with a repentant heart and asking Him for help is the first step toward freedom. When we acknowledge we're wrong and we want to change, God always delivers us. He empowers us to overcome even the most enormous challenges. He backs us up with his own supernatural might and enables us to overthrow our oppressor. And for those of us who happen to be women, well, let's just say God can give a whole new meaning to the phrase, fight like a girl. Sisera can verify that. His worst nightmare started with a feisty woman of God named Deborah. An Israelite prophetess, she started the revolt that ended in his demise by sending for a warrior named Barak and relaying to him the word of the Lord, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude at the river of Kishon. 
and I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Judges 4, verses 6 through 9. As you can see from the last phrase of that passage, Deborah wasn't the only woman Sisera needed to worry about. Another one, just as dangerous, had been appointed by God to finish what Deborah had started. Her name was Jael. She was the woman Sisera turned to for help when Deborah and Barak's army of 10,000 Israelites rose up against him. It's ironic, but it's true. On the day the Lord routed his troops and slaughtered all his army, with the edge of the sword before Barak. Verse 15. Sisera fled on foot, frantic to save his own skin, straight to Jael's tent. At the time, Sisera's logic made sense. He figured that because Jael was the wife of a Kenite man who had a treaty with Jabin, she'd be likely to provide him a place to hide. And sure enough, at the outset, it appeared he was right. Coming out of her tent to greet the battle-weary warrior, Jael said exactly what he wanted to hear. Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with the blanket. And then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the door of the tent, and if any man comes and inquires of you and says, Is there any man here? You shall say no. Verses 18 through 20. J.L.'s hospitable response to Sisera seems odd for someone we've chosen as a mentor, don't you think? I mean, really, what kind of woman opens a door to a tyrant, offers him a snack, and tucks him in for a nap? What kind of woman hides the enemy in private while in public she claims she hasn't seen him and everything's all right? Women like us, that's who. We've all done it at one time or another. We've entertained the enemy of our souls and tried to keep it hidden. We've let secret sin slip into our thoughts and attitudes. Suffering on the inside from Satan's oppression, we smiled on the outside and pretended nothing is wrong. It's no surprise, then, that J.L. chose to do the same, at least for a while, until exercising a woman's prerogative, she decided to change her mind. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what prompted the change. Maybe as she watched the sleepy Sisera snoring in her tent, she began to think about his cruelty to the Israelites over the previous twenty years. Maybe she remembered with mounting indignation how he had attacked and killed them when they were defenseless, how he had stolen their property and captured and raped their women. Perhaps she pictured the faces of her Israelite friends and contemplated her family's historic ties to their nation. After all, her husband was a descendant of Moses' father-in-law. The Canaanites and the Hebrews had been linked for generations. Whatever J.L.'s line of reasoning It brought her to this conclusion. She owed nothing to the Canaanite named Sisera who had brutalized God's people for so many years. He was no friend of hers. He was her enemy and he deserved to be defeated. Somebody had to put an end to his ruthless reign. And the question was who? Barak and his soldiers couldn't do it. If they searched Jael's tent without her husband's permission, it would be considered an insult by their Kenite friends. Sheltered from Israel's army, Sisera was safe and cozy. The only way to stop his oppression was for J.L. to end it herself. Truth be told, the same is true for you and me. We're the only ones who can extinguish the enemy that's resting in our soul. Only we have the power to get rid of him. Others can come alongside and help, but nobody else can do it for us. Ultimately, it's up to us to decide we're done playing hostess to the oppressor. Get honest about the trouble he's caused us and use the word of God to strike him a deadly blow. 
which is precisely what J.L. did, with one difference, of course. Because her battle was literal, she needed a physical weapon, and not just a spiritual one to win it. Glancing around her tent, she spotted just what she needed, her hammer. As a Kenite woman responsible for pitching the household tents, she had used it countless times to drive tent pegs into the ground. She knew how to wield it with speed and accuracy. She reached for it, then fixed her eyes on her wicked guest and said to herself, This is a new day. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And then, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, dead with a peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. Verses 21 through 23. One plus God is a majority. When Jael killed the enemy hiding in her tent, she didn't just free herself. She also liberated a nation. She emancipated generations. When we follow her example, we do too. Our personal victories over sin and Satan affect our husband, our children, and even our grandchildren. When we conquer the oppressor in our lives, we embolden other believers to do the same. That's why it's so vital for us to identify the enemy and put an end to him. When he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, we must be determined to take God's word and drive him into the ground. I didn't always know such victory was possible. In fact, for years, I had no idea it was necessary. Growing up in a denomination that pretty much ignored the activities of Satan, and the Holy Spirit too, for that matter, I didn't even realize I had an enemy working against me. I tried to be the best Christian I could. But if you don't recognize you're in a battle, it's pretty tough to win. So I spent the first part of my Christian life losing big time without even knowing it. That's not to say I was involved in anything especially shocking. Raised to be what you might call a good girl, I mostly fell prey to the good girl kinds of sin. Pride, for instance. Not the pride that says, look at me, I'm better than everyone else but the insecure version that worries and wonders. What are people thinking about me? Am I dressed right? Am I following the right protocol? Am I saying the right things and making a good impression? It was an oppressive form of self-focus that kept me busy varnishing the outside while neglecting what really mattered most, the hidden person of the heart. 1 Peter 3 verse 4 I'd still be bound by that kind of oppression today if I'd never learned to identify the enemy behind it. But, by the grace of God, I did. I found out from the Bible that Satan is very real and much more active than I'd been taught to believe. And like it or not, I was caught in the middle of a spiritual war. Granted, when Robert and I first made that discovery, we got a bit carried away with it. Like a lot of Christians, when they first learn about spiritual warfare, we saw the enemy everywhere. The traffic light would turn red when we were in a hurry and we would rebuke the devil. The dinner rolls would burn and it was Satan's fault. Honestly, it alarmed me at first to think he had so much power. He doesn't, of course. I realized that later. As I studied the scriptures, I began to understand that even though Satan is a formidable enemy in many ways, he's no match for the Holy Spirit who lives within me to empower me and teach me. In the midst of a battle, the Holy Spirit can whisper insight to me. He can bring the Word of God to my remembrance, arming me with the sword of the Spirit. He can make me like Jael with a hammer and tent peg, a mighty woman of God against the battle-weary foe. Such revelations greatly encouraged me. The Holy Spirit removes the devil's advantage, I thought. 
he levels the spiritual battlefield. It sounded good at the time, but it wasn't quite right. As I learned more about the power of the Word and my helper, the Holy Spirit, I realized the battlefield isn't level at all. It's tilted mightily to my advantage. Because through Christ, Satan has already been defeated, my victory is assured. If I just stand my ground and use my weapons, the war is already won. At five feet, three inches tall, I may be just a little girl, but I can rout the devil's army because one plus God is a majority. Actually, we all need to cultivate that attitude because as women of God, it's our job to kill the enemy of our soul, not just once like J.L. did, but again and again and again. For us and for all believers, walking in freedom is a process. We keep on gaining it, one victory at a time, engaged in a perpetual battle with an enemy determined to oppress us. We can never sit down and say we've arrived. We can never rightly claim we've secured all the freedom we're ever going to need. Instead, we must always be on the lookout. We must continually remember that Satan is a ruthless tyrant, dangerous and persistent. He loves to prey on our defenselessness, our ability to provide for our families, and the sanctity of our homes. We can't afford to entertain him for a moment, even in secret. So when we find ourselves under his influence in some area of our lives, we must cry out to God like the Israelites did. We must seek the Lord and ask him to show us how the enemy gained entrance and what we must do to put a tent peg through his head. What if Satan gets to me through somebody else's actions, you might ask? What if I'm under oppression because I've been victimized by another person who wronged me? Then the first tent peg you'll need is the power of forgiveness. Because freedom is not for victims. It's for victors. And the only way to step from victimhood to victory when we've been wounded is by forgiving the person who hurt us. It may sound hard, but we can do it. The Bible assures us that since God has forgiven us, we can forgive others. Yes, we may have to put some prayer into it. I know that from experience. There was a time in my life when I felt so wronged, it seemed impossible for me to forgive. I tried to do it over and over, but within hours or sometimes only minutes, I would find myself fuming with resentment again. Mentally replaying the injustice I had suffered, I'd argue my case in an imaginary courtroom. I declared my innocence for the hundredth time and present the evidence against those who had harmed me. With great satisfaction, I'd imagine the whack of the judge's gavel as he rendered his verdict against them guilty. Then one day, Jimmy Evans, host of Marriage Today television show and pastor of Trinity Church in Amarillo, Texas, preached a message on forgiveness at Gateway. Describing a similar incident in his life, he shared how God had taught him that by praying for the person who had wronged him, he could break free from the dislike and unforgiveness he felt toward that person. I didn't want to hear that. But I swallowed my irritation and put the principle into practice. Every time I caught myself reopening the case in my mental courtroom, I prayed. I'll confess that at first my prayers weren't very nice. I prayed things like, God, show them their wicked ways and be gentle when you smite them. But over time, my heart changed. My attitude softened. And I really began to love the people who had hurt me. I started wanting them to succeed and prosper, and my prayers reflected it. That's when I knew I was free. What's under that blanket? In dealing with the enemy of our souls, we don't always have the advantage J.L. did. She knew full well the evil she was entertaining. She knew who Cicero was and what he was up to before she ever invited him into her tent. He 
didn't sneak in and hide under a blanket while she was pulling weeds outside. He didn't disguise himself as a vacuum cleaner salesman and convince her he meant no harm. Satan, however, does that kind of thing all the time. He sneaks into our lives when we aren't paying attention. He slips up on us so subtly we hardly even notice he's there. A master deceiver, he covers himself in lies. He dims the light in our souls so that he can oppress us in darkness without being seen. That's why in our quest for freedom, we should ask God to do for us what David asked in Psalm 13, verse 3. Consider and hear me. O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. That's a powerful prayer. I use it in my own life whenever I'm pressing in for a higher level of liberty. It helps me identify areas where the enemy has been hiding. It opens the door for the Lord to show me sins I've been blind to, so I can repent and obey. As we've already established, that's where real freedom always starts, with repentance and obedience. I've been to the most dramatic deliverance services you can imagine. I've heard people yell at the devil and watch them toss their cookies into paper bags. But you know what? When those services were over, I walked out thinking, my God is bigger than that. He doesn't need theatrics to deliver us. All he needs is our sincere hearts, crying out to him for help. All he needs is for us to ask him to open our eyes and then for us to do what he shows us to do. In my life, the most powerful season of deliverance I've ever experienced came through a simple little book full of soul-searching questions designed to challenge believers to examine their lives and get honest with the Lord about hidden sin. It asked things like, Do you have a problem lying? And then it added, Be honest. Because I earnestly wanted to be free from every oppression of the devil, I took those questions seriously. With the Holy Spirit's help, I began to identify weaknesses and strongholds of sin in my life. Then, as the book instructed, I asked other believers to pray with me about those weaknesses and strongholds. It was humbling. But James 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. So I did it. I opened up the hidden places of my heart that no one else could enter unless I invited them. It still amazes me how much that simple process changed my life. It brought me to a whole new level of freedom, having driven a spike into the enemy of my soul. Does that mean I walked away from it finished and fixed forever? Could I brush my hands together and say, there, that does it? I'm permanently free? Certainly not. Although I've made a lot of progress in that season, there are always more battles to fight and more territory to conquer. I was reminded of it in a fresh way just a couple of years ago, at a time when great things were happening for Robert and me in ministry. A major storm blew up in my personal life. I lost my dad. Our kids hit some rough times and Robert and I were writing a book on marriage, busy with the church and traveling a lot. Pressures mounted from all sides, and I began to crumble. No one knew it, of course. From the outside, I looked fine, so I had a choice to make. Would I just ignore the resentment and frustrations building inside me? Would I opt to play religious games and stand at the door of my tent, waving and smiling at people, pretending that all was well? Or would I seize the crosses, get honest with myself, with God, and another believer, and use the situation as an opportunity to drive out the enemy and attain a greater degree of freedom? I chose the latter. Taking a deep breath, I did what I encourage our staff members in our congregation to do when they're struggling. I walked into our freedom pastor's office and ask if she had a few minutes to talk. Oh, how I hoped she would respond to my emotional outpour with a shrug, a smile, and a pat on the back. 
how I wanted her to say, nothing to be concerned about. Anyone would feel the same way in your situation. But she didn't. Instead, she said, I think we need to talk about this some more. Can you come back? Uh-oh, not a good sign. As much as I hated to admit it, I knew she was right. So I went to see her multiple times during the months that followed. As we talked, I discovered the storm I'd encountered wasn't really the problem. It had just uncovered some areas where I needed to change my perspective. Like a gust of wind whipping away a picnic blanket, it had lifted the covers in my soul and exposed a few more sleeping Ciceras. I hadn't even realized they were there, but once I identified them, drove a tent peg through them, and made the necessary changes, I stepped into a higher place of strength and freedom. I took new spiritual ground, not just for myself, but also for others in my life, now and for years to come. Following in J.L.'s footsteps, I inflicted one more major headache on the enemy and reminded him just how dangerous God's girls can be. You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.